Well, it is an absolute joy to welcome Professor John Hort uh, today. Welcome, John. Happy to be here, Andre. I it has, it's been such a delight for me to um, delve into your books. The first one that I read was Resting on the Future. And there are very few theological books that I can't put down because of the excitement of each chapter. But <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely one of them. And yeah. since then, I've uh, just devoured everything that I could get a hold that you've written and where you've spoken. And one of the, the theme that we're dealing with today is the value and the reality of time. Now, popular science fiction, entertainment, media, it seems like so many of our stories and our narratives are obsessed with the idea of escaping time. I don't know of any good science fiction movie that's come out in the past few years that doesn't have time travelers in it. <laughs> Some, somehow they can overcome the reality of a past and the future and move in between. Yes. But that desire to escape time is not only in our entertainment, in our science fiction, it's also in our philosophy and very much in our theology as well. And what I appreciate in what I've read in your books, John, is a deep appreciation for the value and the reality of time. How yes. did you come to that conclusion? Well, it's, uh, it's been a preoccupation of mine for many years. And sometimes I like to introduce why that's the case is by looking at uh, two men of science who are also very interested in time. And they are Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the uh, geologist. And if I had them together in conversation, uh, the first question I would ask of them is, what is it that gives you joy? Yeah. And I think in their answers to that question, they would, if they developed them, give you two vastly different ways of looking at the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, Einstein would say, what gives me joy, in fact, rapturous enjoyment, is the awareness that my geometry has led me to, that there is this beautiful, perfect world that's defined by geometrical forms. And that, for me, is, is what delights me. That's, that world is a world of timelessness. Mm -hmm. And the more I've gotten into Einstein's life and work, the more I think his main passion is to place himself at not just as a thinker, but as a person mm -hmm. in the world of timelessness. Okay. Why? Uh, because timelessness is a world devoid of perishing. Mm -hmm. We humans, that's always been our main problem what to do with the fact of perishing. Yes. Uh, Heraclitus cried over the fact that everything runs away in time. Yeah. And so many uh, religious people, philosophers and theologians mm -hmm. have had the same reaction. So mm -hmm. what delights Einstein, especially, not, not him alone, but many others mm -hmm. from Plato on down, from the Orphic myths that gave rise to Plato's thought on down, is the prospect that there is a world beyond the world of time mm -hmm. in which I can find my true home and my real identity. Yeah. And that is something as prominent, in, in my view, in Einstein as it was in the ancient Greek uh, philosophers. Yeah. Whereas for Teilhard, who's a Christian geologist, mm -hmm. evolutionist, paleontologist, and also a deeply religious thinker, if I asked him the same question, what delights you? He would say, it's the prospect that something is coming from up ahead in the future. Wow. Love and it. That sort of sums up his whole spirituality in, in a way. Uh, nothing gives him more joy than the realization that this is not all there can be. The mm. present is not 
does not exhaust the real world, mm -hmm. um, nor does a, an eternal present uh, stand for him as something more desirable. Mm -hmm. What turns him on spiritually is the prospect that there's always something new, unprecedented, and unpredictable awaiting from up ahead. And that, and that that for me is so beautiful because I in in reading some of his biography as as a younger um, a teenager I think or even as a child he was really upset as well by the perishing of things and yeah. and he actually found something more substantial when he started studying the rocks and the stones. But it's so beautiful that for him, the logic of it developed not in terms of an eternal preservation of a static moment, but rather, as you say, everything is moving towards, or even more profoundly, something divine is coming towards us. Yeah. Uh, and that fills him with joy. Yeah. And, uh, you mentioned his, uh, in his youth, even when he was four or five years old, mm. uh, he says in his uh, good essay to read on this is uh, an essay called The Heart of Matter, okay. which sums up Payard's thought beautifully. Yeah. But in that essay, he talks about uh, his lifelong search for what he called consistence. Mm -hmm. He doesn't call it consistency, but it's translated usually as consistence, okay. something solid something that can satisfy him at the very heart of his existence. So he first experiments with rocks and pieces of iron when he's a young kid. Mm. And he says that what really terrified him was once when I guess one of his parents threw a lock of his hair into the fire, into the fireplace, and he saw it go up in smoke. Mm. And it filled him with an anxiety that defined his spirituality throughout his whole life. Wow. We have to find a solution to the fact that perishing is, it, it, it is obsessive with him. Yeah. So he, throughout his life, was trying to find this. And uh, after he became a geologist, one reason for which was it studies rocks and hard things and mm -hmm. consistence, uh, he thought, well, maybe I can find what I'm looking for in the world of matter. Hmm. After all, what could be more solid and substantial than matter? Yeah. Then as he learned science, he learned that uh, science can resolve even the hardest things into bits of some subatomic stuff so that matter itself dissolves or granulates hmm. the closer we get to the beginning of the cosmos, as it were. Hmm. So whereas most myths have tried to go back to origins to find that uh, consistence. Hmm. There, after science, after evolution, after Big Bang cosmology, the more we go back to the past, the more things fall apart into pieces wow. and bits. Yeah. So eventually he concluded, I'm not going to find what I'm looking for by being a materialist. Yes. Although there was a materialist streak in him, like hmm. I think there is in all of us, hmm. uh, that uh, tempted him uh, hmm. as a young scientist. Uh, when he looked out at the vast deserts yeah. of, Cairo, of Cairo, of Egypt, uh, there was something almost mystical or mystically attractive about that world of sheer stuff without life. You know? yeah. And it's almost something in us, too, mm. in all of us, that, that is, is afraid of life. Mm. So we easily find a resolution of that anxiety. Many, many people do. Many scientists, many philosophers do. Uh, in pure matter. So he understands the materialist perspective. He understands the power, the seductive, mystical power of losing yourself yeah. in this uh, ocean uh, or nirvana yeah. of no differentiation of just plain stuff. Yeah. But he found uh, that the more he gravitated in that direction, hmm. the more he lost touch with what he called the personal. Mm. And it's only when we find ourselves as persons, yeah. and especially in conversation with other persons mm. and with a personal God, yes. that he found the joy that, that okay. he was looking for. So the joy can't be purely material. It has to have a personal aspect mm. to it. I mean, 
because after all, in our experience, what is more intense than the reality of another person? Nothing, mm. nothing is. Nothing attracts us, but also repels us. Mm. It's sort of a mysterium tremendum et fascinans, a fascinating mystery, but also anxiety in, yeah. inducing. So he couldn't find consistence in that direction. Mm. So, now he's a geologist who spent his life digging into the past, yeah. but he found his consistency only when he turned 180 degrees and looked toward the future. Wow. Uh, he found a joy in, in that sense that there's an unknown future coming yeah. from up ahead. And uh, little by little, he theologically identified that future with with God. Yeah. And, uh, and that's very different from Einstein then because... Exactly. It's just the opposite almost. Yeah. Einstein not... did not care much for the personal. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't done a full psychological study of him, but it seems that he was quite content to avoid too much uh, personal contact. Yes. And a lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like that. It's, and it's interesting how that then links up to time because uh, I love it. Uh, I, I was um, privileged to have a preview of your upcoming book, God After Einstein, and the way in which you draw the distinction between Einstein's scientific uh, discussions, his philosophical musings, and even his theological speculations. But one thing that is often quoted as if it is science, because Einstein said it, <laughs> is the idea of time is an illusion. Although it's a very persistent illusion, it remains an illusion. Right. But interestingly, as you point out in your book, that is not something science proves by any means. That was more philosophical stance. That he Just positional. It's a temperamental yes. thing justified by his geometry. Yes. Um, the world of geometry is an impersonal world. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. it's a, but it's a world of forms, uh, aesthetic forms that satisfy his aesthetic sensitivity and mm -hmm. even his religious sensitivity. If you understand mm -hmm. by religion what it has meant probably more often than not, religion is an attempt to escape from time mm -hmm. into the perishable, indestructible world of timelessness. Yes. And that's satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Plato was the great apostle of timelessness, and we still read Plato, uh, even in an age of science, because yeah. somehow he lifts up our hearts. Mm -hmm. And Einstein's heart, this is how I define spirituality. What is it that lifts up your heart? Yeah. And he found that in, uh, in a world without time, world yeah. without, uh, without movement. And time means the passage from past through present to the future. Mm. But mostly what he saw in time was something imperfect mm. and perishable, the same as Plato. So the more I got into writing the book, God After Einstein, the, the more religious Einstein seemed to me, not, not in Teilhard's sense of openness mm. to the future, but in the traditional and even classical Christian analogical view of reality, mm. which was influenced often more by Plato than by Abraham and the prophets and Jesus, yeah. the, the timeless world that, that we can find our way into. And even today, a lot of Christian spirituality or contemplation mm. is still, to me, in my view, more platonic mm. than biblical. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't need the future. It, it needs to get out of the yes. present, which is and, always imperfect. Yeah. And uh, certainly that is... Um, uh, th that attraction to an experience of what people call timelessness as my understanding of the reality of time has matured and, and grown. I, I've started thinking because I'm sure I've used these terms timeless in trying to describe some of my spiritual experiences in the past. And what I think most people mean by that term timeless is they experience a moment that is so different from their normal experience of the passage of time, whether it is because they're always busy with work, busy coming and going, busy with their careers, and then they have a time of contemplation. And 
it almost feels timeless because they don't have to involve themselves in the things that they normally involve themselves in. But, but even as we speak to people about that experience, there is still often there's a progression of thought or there's a progression of experience. And if time in its most basic definition is a change, is a progression, is a sequence of some kind, then even those experiences aren't purely timeless. They are just a different dimension of time. Yeah, I, that's well put. Um, yeah. And I know exactly what you're talking about. But I think the way uh, I would address that is to distinguish carefully between eternity, which means non-temporal mm -hmm. and everlastingness. Okay. And I think uh, I think you can satisfy your longing mm -hmm. uh, to avoid the tragedy and despair of a purely temporal worldview mm -hmm. by thinking of time as uh, as the beginning of, or as the road to, or the avenue toward imperishability mm. in the form of everlastingness. Mm. Uh, and I think uh, from my Christian point of view, that's what the gospels are saying. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's also, uh, it corresponds to the biblical, the most prominent biblical theme of promise. Yes. That nature and it has within it, uh, this was Teilhard's words, the universe has within it a most beautiful promise of the future. Mm. That that's yeah. the dynamism yeah. that's running the universe. Now we see it in our state of ignorance and despair uh, and, and sinfulness. We see time as uh, purely decay, you know, mm. and, uh, and if that's how you see time, yeah. then it's understandable that we want to find some avenue uh, to exit from some yeah. escape uh, hatch from, mm -hmm. from that world. And that's been, I believe, the dominant view of human religions and philosophies. Yes. Going back to primal myths of uh, the origin of evil, yeah. uh, so many of, the, of the myths of native peoples and uh, pre-scientific people in the past, uh, primal yeah. peoples, had the theme that in order to avoid the uh, the horrors and tragedies of time and history, we have to find our way back to the beginning. Mm. Archea Eliade, the great uh, scholar of religion, often made this point that the terrors of history, the terrors of time, mm. are so impressive on most people uh, that yes. it's understandable and certainly forgivable mm. that they would try to find some strong time, as he called it, a strong yeah. time. And what could be stronger than that initial pulse of being mm. that brought the universe into existence yeah. back then in, the, yes. in illo tempore, in, in, the, in principio? Yeah. In our day, you know, what could be stronger than finding our way back there? Yes. And, you know, even today, uh, when you look at uh, analytical scientists, mm. What they're doing, in, at least after Einstein and the discovery of the Big Bang universe, whenever they take a complex phenomenon like an organism and break it down into cells, the cells into molecules, the molecules into atoms, um, and atoms into subatomic units, they think they're explaining. Mm. They think they're explaining the present by going back and then retracing this yes. the steps. But, but not at all. Actually, what they're doing is instead of arriving at coherence, which mm. is what relation is, finding coherence that unifies the multiplicity of things, yes. they end up setting up their tents way back in primal history where there was just a, a granulated world of subatomic particles. Mm. That's the real world mm. for the, I call it the archaeonomist, the analytical thinker. Um, and uh, and that's appealing in a way because there's something solid, something eternal. That's it, see, that's the world before time began. Yes. So that's their their idea. So they're very religious, is what I'm saying. Yeah. In the quest for the strong time 
when yeah. reality was complete, but before it got tied up with time yeah. and all the mess that that's led to. So that one physicist says says that all this beauty and complexity around us is just uh, complexity. It's its original simplicity yeah. masquerading as complexity. So wow. the world, the world now, uh, uh, of time that's led this far yeah. is an illusion. And yeah. Einstein had something parallel to that when he said uh, that um, the time, the movement of time, the passage mm. of time is a psychological illusion that we project out onto this blank, timeless yes. world. And well, then, that uh, is where I so appreciate that your clear voice that brings a completely new, new perspective to that idea, because even in theological terms, obviously, there are many uh, schemes of the theology that would also seek the truth in some unspoiled origin or some eternal moment. And if we can just get back there. I'm innocent, yeah. Yes, but what I... Um, you brought about one kind of definition. I won't probably, I won't quote it exactly as you said it, but the idea has been imprinted in my heart. And that is that time is the opportunity to accumulate value and to accumulate meaning. That is just the total opposite of the attitude that sees time as a perishing that sees time as a blossoming, as a unfolding of meaning and beauty. And I love that, that conclusion, John. And this is, this is the irony of Einstein and, and why I'm so delighted to study his, his ideas. Uh, for him, uh, uh, I mean, he's, he's the one who discovered without knowing it yes. that, that time and matter are inseparable. Yeah. Before Einstein, philosophers and scientists all thought of time as a kind of container into which God, uh, if you're a believer, puts stuff. Hmm. Uh, but time is, and, and, and this, this came through again in Kant, who made time an a priori category hmm. of the mind that we impose uh, time and space as a priori sensory categories in which we put all of our experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kant too lived before Einstein. Einstein uh, brought about for the first time, I think, a sense that the universe is not just a vague background of time and space. The universe is a set of integrated finite things attracted together by gravity. So we're able to study the universe and Einstein was right to point out that uh, if you have a proper understanding of nature, of matter, of the universe, mm -hmm. then you'll see that time is somehow inseparable from that. Mm -hmm. That was a great development in human thought, uh, because no longer can we think of nature without thinking of time. If time disappears, nature disappears. Mm -hmm. So they're tied together. But unfortunately, Einstein did not think of time that he was integrating with matter as something that flows directionally, mm. irreversibly from past into, into the future. That was yeah. all, he was still too Kantian uh, yeah. to get rid of the idea that space and time are still uh, subjective illusions in a way. Yeah. So he relegated time in his cosmology to just another dimension of space. Yes. So he spatialized, he spatialized time. Yeah, And Alfred North Whitehead, who was his contemporary, uh, mm. pointed out that that's the chief mistake of modernity, mm. to have abstracted time out of existence by spatializing it, making it a, a function of uh, not the real world, not the concrete world, but some, some other sort of realm. Mm. So for Whitehead, time, and this is where I picked up originally my obsession with time, mm. uh, Reality is not made up of subatomic units, atoms, molecules. Reality is temporal, not spatial. We know this after Einstein. Mm. And a temporal reality uh, is you break it down not into things, not into atoms, not into bits of matter, mm. but you subdivide it into happenings mm. or events. So events yes. become the fundamental unit of the universe. Yes. Uh, in Whitehead's interpretation of relativity. Yes. 
and and that uh, that has influenced a whole development in theology called process theology, which I'm sure uh, you're familiar yes. with. Um, yes, and I, I love the space that that also opens for because if if time is the relationship between events and not just the relationship between stuff or material, but then we can think of of psychological time. I can. I can think of consciousness or the development of one thought to another, uh, the kind of things that were, that are not material, psychic events, uh, whatever your doctrine of God is, if you believe it's some kind of consciousness, there is a progression in thought. If you think God has experiences, God can act or God can think, then by definition, you are actually thinking of God as a temporal agent, uh, as somebody who experiences time. And because suddenly time is no longer something on its own. It is just relational movement. And wherever you find relational movements, we just have abstracted the concept from it and called it time. But we can't get away from the reality of that movement. And as you say, always moving in a direction. And, and it's changed my understanding of God. Uh, and I tried to develop this somewhat in my forthcoming book, uh, God After Einstein. Yes. Uh, if reality, if, if the universe rather, is fundamentally temporal, made up of events, mm -hmm. then what is God? Uh, and this is why I thought I experiment with the idea that in some sense, God is not yet. Mm. Uh, and, and that into which all the events are taken and preserved mm. everlastingly. So yes. I use the word everlasting of God, mm. uh, God's everlasting love yes. rather than eternal, because eternal suggests taking things out of time. Mm. Instead, I think the biblical view, the es eschatological view of the Bible, which is very rich and diverse, mm -hmm. but it comes mm -hmm. down uh, in the sense to, to saying that uh, uh, it's, it's not where God is, but when is God? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? <laughs> and that's true psychologically for us as individuals. When, when oh Lord, and, and the prayers of the psalmists yeah. are so beautiful yeah. in that, in that uh, context because the fundamental virtue is that of waiting. Yes. Uh, it's those who wait for God will mm. not be put to shame, but also yeah. God as waiting also, waiting yeah. for the universe. And, yes. and so yes. it's, it's a beautiful theology of waiting. Yes. And, um, yes. Paul Tillich, by the way, has a, yeah. has a really interesting meditation called Waiting. It's, you can find it online. I, I recommend yeah. everybody find that and read it because it's a, it's a real profound... Uh, interpretation of what it means to wait. And he ends up saying, we are stronger when we wait. Yes. We possess. Yeah. And we all know this from our own spiritual and sinful experience. Yeah. Once we've found what we think we're looking for, we grab it and hug it. Yes. And we become more disappointed than before. Yeah. And, and we enslave ourselves yeah. to the present, yeah. some present phenomenon. Mm. And we can become weak the yeah. more enslaved we become. Whereas if, if we wait, we're opening ourselves to the coming yes. of something more proportionate to what we need spiritually, something yeah. that fills us up much yeah. more than a timeless phenomenon would. Because that's also a God that cannot be exhausted. <laughs> if your God is just a, a God of the past or a God of the eternal present, um, those things can be explored and uh, uh, but there's an aspect of god we miss if we don't see the god yeah. who's not yet I'm, I'm thinking of the the text in revelation which um where he speaks about uh, uh, the god who was and is and is to come and there's interesting ways of interpreting that but one of the ways is to say that there's something temporal about God. There's something about God that was. In other words, it's no longer. <laughs> and there's, there's something about God. God's being. 
<laughs> yes. of the past it's all God's creativity yes ab absolutely and, and and the fact that God could experience all of creation with us throughout the past he was truly present he was um yes. but there is that aspect of God that that is not yet which I think that is a key ingredient for us to not make another idol of God, because there's something about this God that is not completely definable or capturable based just on salvation history or on your theological history. There's something about God that's still unfolding. That's so exciting. There's something not yet also, if you read the uh, uh, canonical gospels mm -hmm. and the a way in which Jesus, uh, the the new life of Jesus, post-resurrection life of Jesus, mm -hmm. is as elusive, and I call it the not yet uh, experience of the Easter, and and how Jesus comes uh, becomes present to them, but only in the sense of calling them forward mm -hmm. into the future. So, so I suppose some early Christians wanted uh, like the. Uh, pagan religions to just settle down and wallow in the new presence. But most of them felt an a, a, a invitation to yeah. commit themselves to, to the future, to spreading yeah. the gospel, to, to making, uh, making the future inflame the whole culture of the Mediterranean at yeah. the time. And yeah. You see a drastic transition going on. But you also see in early Christianity the strong temptation to go back to the timeless mm. God. And mm. this appears Christological controversies of yes. the early church, and especially if you read the Nicene Creed, mm -hmm. which was crystallized in the fourth century, yes. you see all those forces of resistance uh, that come from the old Platonic or Neoplatonic uh, way of yes. looking at things, wrestling with the incarnate God of uh, the Gospels. Yes. And and how the early Christian heresies, Docetism, Marianism, almost all of them, even though they were very diverse, had one thing in common. They wanted to find some way in which God can heal us, uh, but if God comes fully into history and time, mm. then will not God's indestructibility be lost? So mm. how to preserve the indestructibility of God while mm. at the same time making God fully incarnate in the mm. world. That's the problem. And it still is, uh, yeah. I think, the fundamental problem of Christianity, how to mm. interpret the incarnation yes. of God without uh, following, making God fully finite, and perishable. Yeah. Yes. And it all played out in wrestling over what it means to say that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that is what was captured in First John, where he said, this is how you recognize error from truth. Those who deny that God came in the flesh, that Jesus was actually part of this here and now, that's missing the mark. Uh, however, we need to adjust our philosophies or our categories of understanding. We've got to come to peace with the fact that somehow God is at home in flesh, <laughs> in this reality. That says it very beautifully, yes, exactly. Yeah. And this is where uh, it, it intrigued me uh, to read uh, Einstein and his mm -hmm. view of time, yeah. um, because ironically, he taught us that we are fully temporal, yes. but at the same time, he had a spirituality which pulled us out of time and in, into yeah. Platonic of timelessness and his denial of, of freedom, mm -hmm. uh, his denial of a personal God, all this is of a piece with his understanding time as not real. Yeah, you know, yeah. In order for freedom to exist, each moment of yes. the past time has to be open to a new future. Yes. So the theme of futurity and freedom are tied very close together. If there's no future, that's distinct from the past. If it's all just as uh, 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 the physicist Atkins puts it, simplicity masquerading as complexity, mm. then the simplicity is the only thing real. And that was there before time began. So let's yeah. go back there. Yes. And, uh, 
uh, and it's totally impersonal. It's yeah. <laughs> it's not very interesting that kind of simplicity yeah. because there's you know the beauty that time has produced. Yeah. There is anyone who just spends a little bit of time in nature. Yeah. There's somehow a sense that we are being seduced into beauty and goodness, yeah. but this diversity could come from simple subatomic atoms. Um, there is a sense of wonder that, that beauty is drawing us, inviting us yeah. and creating opportunities uh, for becoming. And I love this as well in many of your uh, your writings, the opportunities for true novelty. That uh, that the opposite of what Atkins says that you know yes. the complexity is just a reordering of the simple particles. That actually the the creative God is still active within this creation is still happening, and true novelty can still come about. And another aspect um, that you bring out so beautifully is not just newness in terms of material creation, but newness in terms of meaning, that there's a narrative that's being developed. And we are invited to even participate in creating that narrative. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point. Well, once Einstein joined matter to time, uh, if you take time as something that really flows from past or future, you have the, uh, the, the opportunity mm. to tell stories. Yes. Uh, what, uh, one physicist one time defined time as that which keeps everything from happening at once. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there's something very profound about that. Mm. Because if you have a timeless view, then you're going to dismiss the passage of moments as irrelevant, mm. uh, as decay, mm. as flight from timelessness, which yeah. is where we really belong, so forth. But once you uh, accept time as real, mm. then then you have to think of, of time, uh, the passage of time as carrying a promise yes. of fulfillment. So my views, even though they might seem different, I think are really the biblical, the biblical mm. view of things. That um, Teilhard responds to those physicists who talk mm -hmm. about how the universe is running down and and it's an, it going to end up in a equilibrium where all of life and everything that's been accomplished in time and history is going to go down the pit of, of nothingness. Mm -hmm. Teilhard says, if you really believe that, if you and he doesn't think most people do, they say it, mm -hmm. but they don't really milk it for what it's really saying. If you really mm -hmm. believe that, we should all go on strike uh, yes. right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, if, if if you thought that after six trillion years or whatever it all goes down the tube, even that thought is going to uh, diminish your enthusiasm mm. about action. Yeah. So action itself, not just thought, but action in the world, doing things to make the world better, yes. does not make sense unless there's a framework yeah. within which the goodness that you've done is preserved everlastingly. Yes. And this is this is where uh, I think the, the theme of God's everlastingness mm. as inexhaustible yeah. is better than the theme of God's static, uh, eternal presence. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and if God is just presence and mm. not future, then this presence would so overwhelm us as to annihilate us. Mm. Uh, Jürgen Moltmann, the, the great Reformed theologian. Uh, in his book, Theology of Hope, uh, mm -hmm. uh, makes, makes a, a, a good point of that, that, yes. uh, that, that uh, without the theme of the future, mm -hmm. then God, uh, the Bible says, who can see God and live? Yes. <laughs> you can't see God. That's, that's their way of saying a God who's fully present yes. would not let the world be itself. Yeah. Would not allow the world opportunity to become something 
And, and that's the, the, the problem with pantheism as I see mm -hmm. it. Uh, and why Einstein, not surprisingly, was attracted towards Spinoza, the mm -hmm. great pantheist, mm -hmm. who refused to differentiate the, uh, the world from God. Yes. Well, that, presents, that prevents God from becoming future. Yeah. And that removes the avenue uh, for the world to become something new. Yeah. Uh, so uh, pantheism is probably the, the most impatient mm. of all religious views because it says that everything real has already happened. Mm. Mm. Real. Nothing can, can change the eternity and necessity of the world. Yes. Uh, attributes that were originally attributed to God by Platonic theology, eternity and necessity. Mm -hmm. Now that God is not separate from the world to Spinoza, mm -hmm. then the world has to be yes. eternal. Yeah. And, this, and that means there's no real future to the world. Yeah. There's no possibility of freedom either mm -hmm. that, because everything is fixed. Yes. Um, and so um, Einstein was comfortable with that view. Yeah, yeah. Because for him, it was eternity that he loved. He loved eternity more than time. Yeah. Even though he's yeah. a great discoverer of the <laughs> if tied up of time to the real world. Yes. Uh, there's, there's so many fascinating thoughts in what you just explored as well. But um, I hope we'll find another opportunity to chat again. But what I want to make our listeners aware of, um, I think a great introduction, maybe it's just because it was my introduction to, to John's book, <laughs> is um, <laughs> resting on the future. That's a great uh, place to start. There's many others as well. Uh, but uh, John, you also have God after Einstein. Do you have a date yet as to when that will be published? I just sent the manuscript away to uh, Yale yesterday. Okay. I kept going over it and over it. And okay, found... so we'll wait patiently. <laughs> and I'm not finding perfection in the world of time. I, I, <laughs> I finally concluded that it was true of my work too. <laughs> so, but I, I, I think it won't be out. Uh, um, they have to do a final review of it. Um, mm. but don't be surprised. <laughs> okay. uh, and it probably will come out sometime in 21 or 22. They take forever. Okay. They, they the eternal presence at yeah. most of the press, university presses. <laughs> yes. Well, then I won't even mention God after Talia de Jardin because that's <laughs> following that one. Yeah. <laughs> And this is my next project. And that um, will come up with Orbis, Orbis Press. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for your thank time you. today. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I know um, the people watching uh, are going to love it as well. Thank you. Best to you. <laughs>